we are on the precipice of a uh, pay-per-view UFC 293 Adesanya versus Strickland going down on Adesanya's home turf in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. Well, even though Adesanya is uh he's from New Zealand, right? Yep. It's still his uh his neck of the woods in the world. Uh headlined by Israel Adesanya putting his UFC middleweight title on the line against one Sean Tarzan Strickland. We are going to preview and discuss, uh, looks like about six of these bouts out of the 15 or so. Uh, looks 12? like, wait a second, 12-ish. <laughs> uh, before we talk about the six we're going to talk about, are there any other fights or fighters that you guys would like to just quickly spotlight for our viewers and listeners? Omar, you may go first if you wish. I mean, the only one that really, the only one that really catches my eye, honestly, that I'm looking forward to, I guess, ahead of time. I'm sure there'll be a lot of fights that end up being really good, but the Jamie Malarkey John McDessey fight is the one that kind of catches my attention a little bit. That one I'll probably be more purposeful in making sure I don't miss. Uh, I will mention. I agree on that one. And uh, John McDessey is wild. I feel like he fights like once a year and just fights forever. Like I, he's yeah. been <laughs> been in the UFC for at least yeah. fifty years. Got he's me. he jumped out at me too <laughs> on this card, huh? He jumped out at me as well. His first fight in the UFC was in 2010. Oh, yeah, it shit. feels longer. I, I thought it, it was gonna be longer. Like, I thought it was gonna be like 2007 or eight, honestly. But like, oh, I'm now I'm pulling him up. I truly feel like he fights once a year. He just pops up. There he is one time. <laughs> yeah, literally, one fight every single year. I'm not joking. Every single, okay. the The last time he had two fights in a year was 2016. You're right. Wow, you're That's right. Wild. I swear to God, I didn't look at that before. Wow, wow. That's crazy. He literally fights. I once wonder a year. what he does. And it'll be once this year because he ain't gonna fight again. It's already September. I imagine he probably either owns a gym or coaches and does classes and stuff. And is a martial arts instructor or something like that. How old is he? I just closed it. And I want to 38. Look. 38, yeah. He's almost coming from the end Montreal. I did my, uh, hey, I did my honeymoon in Montreal. Great town. I did my bachelor party in Montreal. Great town. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I will spotlight Jack Jenkins against Chepe Mariscal. Um, Chepe debuted up a weight class. Looked really tough. He beat Trevor Peak, um, but he he gets Jack Jack Jenkins here, who has looked really good. Dude rips people's legs apart. Um, but Chepe's in there to scrap, so I'm interested in that fight for sure. Uh, Nasrat Hackbrass is also on this card. Uh, he at one point I want to say was a somewhat uh, up and coming lightweight that a lot of people had their eyes on. He has dropped a few. He got back in the win column over John Mcdessey last year and he's on this card again so i'll i'll be watching that one for sure as well yeah he's fighting landon quinones omar he's the, he's the only uh prospect from this season of tough that i have seen that got a fight so i'm not oh, sure damn. why why he was the choice but yeah, yeah, yeah. Here he is. and he was one okay, of the let's... ones that lost too well obviously they all they lost. All he was lost. one of the well, ones besides, that lost yeah besides the shulo but um yeah, he got tapped out by Jason Knight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. They all obviously eventually lost. But... <laughs> well, they all lost their first fight besides yeah. Oh, yes, He was the only the prospect fight. that won. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this cord. Nice. Uh, I mean, the fights we're going to talk about, I like I like some of these fights, Mark. And it has, like, one of your boys on this card. <sighs> I know. All right, the, first the fight. Main, the main card has three stupid fights out of five on it. Like, I understand there was injuries, but, like, ugh, I don't know. I, I And I also get it, right? Like, it's not that the card is bad, but if you're going to keep raising pay-per-view prices, you're going to have to make the pay-per-views worth it, and this, to yeah. me, doesn't scream, At like, At least put the bucks. Olberg and Jung one on the main card, so I feel like I'm paying for that instead That's of giving true. me that one for free. <laughs> yeah. Instead, you yeah. gave me Justin yeah. Taffa and Austin Lane. Yeah, or Tyson Pedro fighting a guy who's 0-2. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, let's begin. The featured bout on the prelims of UFC 293 in the light heavyweight division, Carlos Olberg taking on Da Woon Jung. Olberg, the black jack, the 32-year-old out of Auckland, New Zealand. He's 
and one as a professional with six knockouts. He's riding a four-fight win streak coming into this weekend. He is four and one in the UFC after uh, winning on, impressively on the Contender Series. He's looking to keep things going over Da Woon Jung, the 29-year-old out of South Korea. He's 15 and four with one draw with 13 finishes, 11 of them knockouts, but he is looking to get back in the win column after dropping back-to-back fights against Dustin Jacoby and Devin Clark. Omar, start us off this time with a, a quick take and a pick of Carlos Olberg against Dawoon Jung. I think it's a great fight, to be honest. Um, I think Dawoon Jung is a really fun and exciting fighter. I think, I think sometimes he could run into issues where he relies on the one big strike a little bit too much because um, he does have it, but I don't think he does. I don't think he always does a great job of setting things up properly, and I think it, I think people take advantage of him as a result of it. Um, Carlos Olberg though is one of those guys that I think will end up trading with him. I do think that Olberg should be a little bit more on the technical side, uh, but I don't necessarily see Olberg taking down Daung Jung and or clinching with him a ton or you know some of the things that I think. Um, Daung Jung has kind of had to endure in his last couple of fights. So uh, I'm going to go with Carlos Oberg on here. Um, I think the striking is should go in his favor. But for being honest, man, Daung Jung has probably just as much likelihood to knock out Carlos Oberg as Oberg does Daung Jung. So okay. it's a real coin flip in that situation. But I'm going to take Oberg. I'll, I'll do it a uh, second round KO. Okay, I'll go next. Uh I, maybe I've gotten a little too confident in my picks because I had been I had been leading our little group here for for too long. But Lead I uh, down to four, baby. I'm <laughs> narrowing it. I'm gonna make this pick a bit more emphatically than Omar. I'm also gonna be taking Olberg, but I see this as a bit of a mismatch. Remember, Olberg thinking back to that fight against Kennedy Zajuku in his first fight in the UFC after Contender Series. Olberg was piecing Z- Zuchuku up in that fight up until the moment that he got caught. By Zuchuku, which goes to show, even at 205, this may not be heavyweight, but these are big boys, and anybody could get knocked out at just about any time. He but also gassed very badly. He did gas pre, in that fight as well. Knockout. That's yeah. true, too. Um, but up until that point, he looked very, very impressive, and he has looked very impressive ever since finishing three of his last four opponents. Uh, I, and if that fight did go his way, he would be a 9-0 and undefeated prospect Uh I think the guy's a future star, and I think that was a, a major course correction after that. And I don't think Da Eun Jung is it. And I think he's going to run Da Eun Jung over. I think he's going to be the much faster striker in there. Give me Carlos Olberg uh, by knockout, I'll say end of the first round. Mark? Yeah, so Olberg is a pretty big favorite, bigger than I even thought he'd be. He's minus 280, and Jung is plus 220 as the underdog. Uh, same height, Jung actually has the one and a half inch reach advantage, but uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm closer to Mike here. Jung is is not bad at all. He's he obviously KO'd um, Zichuku, who is the only man to hand Olberg a loss to this point. So if you want to use MMA math, you can end up on Jung. But I think that the technique level of Olberg is going to be a lot for Dawin Jung to handle. Like look what Dustin Jacoby did to Jung. Another guy with with high level kickboxing, similar to Olberg. I think Olberg's going to kind of do the same thing. Um, he's a guy who seems to really be rounding into form in a scary way, and I, I think he continues that here. And if he does, it's time to move this man up the line. If you look at his little string of fights here, it's kind of like the babyest of steps, fight to fight. I'd like to see him get a, a jump here if he's impressive again, and I think he will be round one knockout. Round one knockout. Okay, we are unanimous for Tyson Pedro. For Carlos Olberg. Oh. <laughs> okay. Next bout, to, Tyson Pedro. Tomato, tomato, Carlos Olberg and Tyson Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> the next bout, Tyson Pedro taking on Anton Turkali. Is that how I say it? Turkali? Turkali? Yeah, Turkalish. Isn't it Turkalish? I thought it was Turkali. Uh, Turkali. I, f- I feel like I remember wondering why it's yes. Turkali when it's a J. But I could be wrong. Maybe they fixed themselves. Maybe they were the ones fucking it up. Uh, the much more important part of his name is his nickname, which is The Pleasure Man, oh, according to Sherdog. Uh, okay, let's set this up. Also in the light heavyweight division, P- Tyson Pedro 
versus Zerkali Pedro, the 31-year-old, out of Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. Australia, Australia. Nine and four is a pro. All finishes in the win column there. Four knockouts, five submissions. Looking to get back, uh, looking to hop right back in the win column after dropping a decision against Modestus Bukowskis back in February of this year. Uh, he's been back and forth with wins and losses in the UFC since he uh, joined up in the UFC back in 2016. Uh, he will be standing across from Anton, the pleasure man, Turkali, the 27-year-old out of Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, he's 8-2 and two as a pro with seven finishes, five of them knockouts, and he is looking to very much find his first uh, UFC victory here after winning on Contender Series. He has gone 0-2 thus far in the UFC, uh, most recently losing to Vitor Petrino back in March by decision. Omar, start, no, Mark, start us off this time. <laughs> so, oddly enough, I guess not oddly, because Tyson Pedro looked very bad in his last fight. Uh, the favorite is the man who's 0-2 in the UFC so far. Uh, Anton is minus 120. Pedro is minus 105. It's nearly a pick on both guys are... Uh, you're paying the vig on either guy. But, uh, yeah, I was surprised to see that. Um, it is a one-inch height advantage for to, for to Turkali, if we're going to say it that way. One-inch <coughs> reach advantage for Pedro. And Tyson Pedro better win this fucking fight. If this man has any intention of doing anything relevant in the UFC, he better win this fight. He looked truly awful in his last fight. And he cannot afford to lose this one if he's going to go anywhere. So I, I do think he was sick going into the last fight, if I recall. I remember I was telling you guys something about the fact that I read that, but now it's escaping me. Something about that he was sick during his weight cut and almost didn't go out there. So I'm going to choose to throw that performance out the window and focus on the prior ones and trust that he can get this done. He had looked good prior to that Bukowskis fight. He had me excited for what he could do. And I'm just going to hope that he reignites that here because I I have not seen anything from Turkali that makes me think he is going to be a factor in this division. And I believe Pedro can, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be a world champ or anything, but he I think he can beat guys who are at least, you know, bottom tier ranked guys uh, from what I've seen in his good performances. So I, I will say he gets it done. I'll go with a round two uh, TKO with ground and pound. Omar. So for context, Tyson Pedro contracted – gastroenteritis there you go before his last fight uh he was basically shitting himself at vomiting right vomiting. that's what it was yes right i remember that's so, what he said now yes. dude was probably hella dehydrated because that's yes. it's pretty bad um anyway i uh Turkali is one of these guys that is looking to crash right he's looking to close the distance he's looking to grapple he's looking to clinch more than likely not necessarily on the ground but he's trying to not allow too much space uh with him and his opponent when they fight and tyson pedro is one of those guys that i think works best obviously at range um i think if pedro can find a way to keep the range or at least work well in the clinch i think he can do well in this fight um i think the approach from turkali is pretty pretty obvious so i think if tyson pedro is prepared properly for this fight i think he can do well so i'll, I'll go with tyson pedro as well i'm gonna do a round one ko yeah we're unanimous on this one as well uh, I like Tyson Pedro in, fight, in, in spite of the fact that he's only 5-4 and four under the UFC banner, but uh, I think the guy can crack. And, I mean, I think this is a close fight, but I'm just going to roll with Pedro here. And I'll say Pedro gets done by UD. Okay. Justin, bad man Tafa taking on Austin Lane. It is a rematch. These two faced off just back in June, but the contest ended within 30 seconds because of a nasty accidental eye poke. Uh, I believe Tafa poked Lane's eye. Other way. Other way. Other way. My bad. Uh, Mark, start us off. Give us your take and your pick. Okay, so Tafa is still a pretty big favorite. I should have looked what he was in the last fight. Actually, how quickly can I see this? I might be able to see this very quickly. <sighs> notes on the prior fight because i'll tell you why i'm curious um oh, i didn't have it on the i didn't write the odds down for the first time they fought 
So, yeah, the reason I say that is because so Tafa is still minus 220 right now, and Austin Lane is plus 180. And I wonder if that's tighter than it was the first fight, because I do think from what we saw in the first fight, granted it was very short, but it looked like the size and the athleticism of Austin Lane were, were going to be a problem for Justin Tafa. He, he was getting kicked to the body repeatedly. I mean, I say repeatedly. Again, the fight was about 30 seconds, but he ate like three, four kicks to the body, whatever it was. He was getting jabbed when he tried to close distance. It, it seemed like he was maybe going to struggle. And, you know, it doesn't mean a ton. It's early in the fight. Tafa could settle in. Obviously, he's got huge knockout power. Lane's fairly unproven. So, I don't know. I don't even know who I want to pick here. I'm just surprised the odds are still that Tafa's more than a 2-1 to one favorite after what we saw. Um, I don't know. You know, Lane looked big and mobile. For sure, his chin is up high. It's out there to be hit. That's exactly what Justin Taffa is in there to do. Oh, I'm very torn. I will say that Austin Lane gets it done by a decision. Okay. Uh, dude, I'm a believer in these Taffa boys, man. And I'm just going to keep rolling with these guys until they fall off, until the wheels fall off right now. Uh, I mean, Austin Lane is a newcomer. He won on Contender Series. Uh, he's has had a pretty impressive pro run thus far. At this point, what is he? He's 12-3 and three so far as a pro. That being said, I haven't don't have any other tape of him in against UFC competition, but I'm going to roll with the big man, Justin Taffa, uh, I still have that memory seared in my brain of him finishing Harry Hunsucker by like kicking through Harry Hunsucker's block of the head kick, and it still like took his soul. Uh, I believe in the Tafa brothers' just power and the ability to just find their shots, and I think they have like a sneaky kind of speed, hand speed. Oh, I uh, agree. Uh, I'll take Tafa round one knockout. And it has happened to Austin Lane before in his career, so I think it happens again. Okay, what do we have next? Oh, we have Omar, Omar to make a pick. Oh, my bad. Omar, go. Sorry. I'm going to need a flag. <laughs> Don't forget me. Huh. Um, You know, I, I get I get the hesitation that uh, on the pick itself because Austin Lane is a very, um, a very athletic human being. Um, I just don't know if I trust him not going through the fire. And I think Justin Taffa is one of those guys that's probably going to probably going to put him in the fire even after one punch. So I, I trust Taffa a little bit more, especially if we're talking about who can hold their own even in a gunfight here. So give me Taffa. I think it's going to get scrappy. I don't think it, it makes it out of the first round. I think they're going to wail on each other for quite some time. Uh, and I think it's going to be pretty violent, pretty quick, and over in that same amount of time. So, Justin Taffa, round one, KO. Okay, moving down to the flyweights. From heavyweight all the way down to fly, we have Manel Starboy Cop taking on Felipe Dos Santos. Manel Cop, the 29-year-old, out of Angola, 18-6 and six as a pro, with 16 finishes, 11 of them knockouts, riding a three-fight Win streak dating back to 2021 coming into this weekend. Uh, Felipe Dos Santos, Lipe de Tona is his nickname. No idea what that means. Uh, undefeated prospect coming into this weekend, 22 years old, out of Brazil, uh, Alagoas, Brazil. Uh, he's 7 0 with one no contest. And uh, this is his UFC debut. Omar, start us off this time. Give us your take and your pick of cop welcoming. Felipe Dos Santos to the UFC. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point it's really about Manel Cop being able to get a fight, um, and so it's 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 whatever's up for grabs here. And Felipe Dos Santos is stepping into the mix in order to get that fight going. Um, but I, you know, as good as the as as good as the resume looks from Felipe Dos Santos, I just think Manel Cop at this point is really just looking for his next meal. Um, and so it's going to be hard for me to really pick against Manel Cop here. So I'm going to go with Manel Cop, second round TKO. Okay, Mark. 
So Cop's a big favorite, as expected. He's minus 385. Uh, Felipe Dos Santos is a plus 295 underdog. Two inches of height on the side of Dos Santos. I couldn't find a reach for him. Um, yeah, man, this fucking poor guy, Manel Cop. He, he cannot get a fight against anyone. Every single booking he has falls through. Most of the time, it makes him not even be able to fight. Thankfully, he finally gets to at least stay on a card here. So I guess thanks to uh, Dos Santos for stepping up and, and letting us actually get to see Manel Cop fight instead of him just being canceled like he has about a million other times. Um, obviously, this was supposed to be Kai Car France. I don't know if one of you guys already said that, but that would have been friggin' amazing yeah. to see. But uh, unfortunately, this is what we got. Um, Dos Santos is a shoot to box guy. shoot to box guy. Can't speak. Um, he wants to scrap. I, I, I think that could make it entertaining while it lasts, but I think that probably bites him here because Manel Cop is just... Very, very good, and I think he will more or less do what he wants. His technique will shine, um, and he will hurt Dos Santos. So I will say Manel Cop round two knockout, and I hope, you know, assuming he gets an impressive win here, I hope he really gives a passionate promo about what he feels he deserves because this guy's ability to move up the ranks has been completely taken away from him over the past couple of years because every every chance he's supposed to have Falls, falls apart somehow. And uh, he needs to vocalize that on the mic and, and demand a, a very big fight. Yeah, I agree. I hope that he, uh, that, th- that these are the lean years for him, that he finds himself in a place where he starts to have some fat years in terms of things going his way and fights coming together uh, and able to put like a, a decent streak together in a, in a, in a decent uh, short amount of time so that, peop- that he stays in people's memory, stays in the promotion's memory. And he says, fresh. I see no reason to not roll with him. Uh, he's an incredible talent, and uh, I think he's going to turn away this prospect and hand Dos Santos his first pro loss. Uh, I'll say that Dos Santos lasts until the third round, but uh, Cop is just too good. He's going to overwhelm him in, let's say, uh, club and sub round three. Just real quick before we move on. The, the the last seven bookings for Manel Cop. God. April twenty twenty two, he's supposed to fight Sue Maderji, canceled. June of twenty two, he's supposed to fight Rogerio Bontarin, canceled. December of twenty two, he finally fights. He beats David Dvorak by decision. March of twenty three, he's supposed to fight Alex Perez, canceled. July of twenty three, he's supposed to fight Davison Figueredo, canceled. This card's supposed to fight Kai Car France, canceled. And now he's getting this. Fucking five of his last six bookings were cancellations. Wow. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, moving up to the heavyweights. Ty Tuivasa taking on Alexander Volkov. Ty Tuivasa, Bam Bam, the 30-year-old out of South Wales, Australia, 14-5 and five as a pro. 13 knockouts. That's right. Only one of his wins has gone the distance. He's looking very much to get back at the win column after uh, dropping back-to-back fights, uh, both in last year. And now he's back, uh, looking to get back in the win column over Mr. Alexander Volkov. Drago, the 34-year-old out of Moscow, Russia. Record stands today at 36-10 and 10 with 24 knockouts. And he is also riding a two-fight win streak coming into this weekend, uh, finishing both Jarzino Rosenstrike a year ago and Alexander Romanov uh, this past spring. I will go first, and I will say this. I'm very torn on this fight. I think this is a very interesting matchup. I think this this could be a great fight. I'm very interested to find out the uh, the spread for this fight because uh, I have no idea who should rightfully be uh, the top dog here. I'm guessing it's going to be Volkov since he has a two fight win streak and Bam Bam has a two fight losing streak. Would that being like said, both of these guys, now? yeah, sure. Volkov minus two fifty, tied to Ivasa Fuck. plus two hundred. Okay, that's aggressive. Pretty wide. Hey, it's a winning streak versus a losing streak. Even though, even though uh, his losing streak was against Cyril Gan and Pavlovich. Uh, I think it's other the matchup, that, personally. 
Tuivasa has horrible. You think the matchup is horrible? For Tuivasa, I think it's a terrible matchup. Oh, you do. I don't think so, but I I don't feel confident about this pick. But I I will. Man, I just I can so easily envision Tuivasa landing some bombs on Volkov. But Volkov, man, he he look has looked so goddamn impressive in his last two outings against Rosenstrike and Romanov, just looking surgical. Romanov wasn't a tremendous win because Romanov came in looking like a super out of shape, man. But then again, Tai Tuivasa has a couple of ugly losses on his record. He lost to Blagoy Ivanov back in 2019. Not his best moment. Oh, I'm going to make a conservative pick. I'll, I'll say Volkov by UD. I hate it. I want to take Ty so bad, but I want to make a smart pick. <laughs> Omar, why don't you go next? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of have the same thought process, too, about wanting to pick Ty. Um, Volkov, for me, is definitely the smarter pick. Um, it's, you know, from a from a stylistic perspective, Volkov likes to play on the outside. Tui Vasa can't play on the outside with a guy like that. A guy with a long, rangy jab, a guy that knows how to move around, a guy that knows how to use his lateral movement. Um, Volkov, though, has shown flaws. He's not perfect. Um, it... I think he's not the kind of guy that can go 15 minutes without making a mistake. And I do think that if he does make a mistake against Tai Tuivasa, he's definitely liable to hit the canvas. Um, so like I said, Volkov is definitely the smarter pick. You guys know better. I don't do smart picks. Let's go fucking Tai Tuivasa, second round KO. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, man. Love it. Uh, so, yeah, so I shared the odds already. Um Five inches of height and five inches of reach on the Volkov side, as expected. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I think Ty's probably going to lose again because MMA sucks. Like, Volkov looks really good right now. He, he's arguably in the best form of his entire career. I mean, he's Swolkov as well. He's much bigger than he was. He's a tough matchup for Ty. Um, now, granted, I, I've, I have always believed in Ty, even when he had that early string of losses. And his current streak against Cyril Gan and Sergei Pavlovich, as Mike kind of alluded to, is Cyril Gan and Sergei Pavlovich. So it's not like he's suddenly fallen off a cliff just because he lost to those two guys. And prior to them, it was five straight knockouts. Now, all, all five of those guys were definitely more knockoutable than Volkov, I would say. So Volkov probably falls in the middle ground between those guys and the two that just beat Ty. So I, I guess in that regard, it does make this a good test for Ty to see exactly where he's at. And I do love that he's at home here. I feel like he he draws great energy from fighting at home. But, man, for him to get inside and KO Volkov is a big ask. It, it's not impossible, but I don't think I can pick it as much as I would like to. Uh, I think the reach and the size of Volkov is going is to help him keep Ty at bay for the most part. I think he's going to be teeping the fuck out of Ty's body um, all fight long. And I think he's probably going to be handling things uh, for the most part. Uh you know the question. The only question I have is just even if that is all happening across fifteen whole minutes, can Ty find a moment? Because all he needs is one. If he finds one, he can end it. But I'm I'm gonna have to say it's a Volkov UD. Okay. And the last one here in the middleweight division. Excuse me. In the main event, UFC two ninety three. It's going down. Israel Adesanya putting his UFC middleweight championship on the line against Sean Tarzan Strickland. Okay, Adesanya, the great, the last style bender, one of the brightest stars, maybe the biggest star in the in the sport, in the promotion at this uh, point in time. The 34-year-old out of Lagos, Nigeria. His record stands at 24-2 and two with 16 knockouts. Most recently, getting uh, one of those knockouts against Alex Pereira back in April of this year. Getting his revenge, finally, on Pereira. Knocking him out in the second round. Grabbing his middleweight title back from Poetan. This time, he will be standing across from Sean Tarzan Strickland, who finally has made it all the way up to that middleweight title shot. 32 years old, out of Anaheim, California. 27 and 5 as a pro. That's a damn good record, man. That's a damn good record for Strickland. 
11 knockouts, another four submissions added to that. And he's riding a two-fight win streak coming into this title fight. Okay. I will go first once again. Uh, I'm not taking, I'm not picking against Adesanya, especially in this matchup. I'm just not. I just can't. Sean Strickland, if there's anything that needs to be said, is that he has a pretty unique style to, uh, to me in terms of a fighting style. He has a pretty unique style overall. Um, but he always presents a little bit of a tricky puzzle to his opponents and how he stalks you. He's a bit of a counter puncher. He's kind of pesky. He's not a one hitter quitter kind of guy, but he does have some knockouts on his record because he does kind of drag you into quicksand quite a bit. But I just cannot see him doing that against a guy who has such elite kickboxing skills in Israel Adesanya. And I don't see Sean Strickland employing any kind of wrestling. That I, I, I don't remember the last time I, I saw him even try to initiate a takedown. Uh, the guy's a brawler. He's a scrapper. And I see him getting pieced up a bit by Adesanya. And I think Adesanya very well could finish him. I could see this going in the way that it went against Cannoneer when Adesanya beat Cannoneer of Adesanya kind of being content to kind of just score and win on the outside and kind of just pick him apart. But you know what? I think this is going to be a little personal, and I I think Adesanya uh, shows out in this fight. And I'm going to say he gets Sean Strickland out of there. I'll say a third-round TKO for Israel Adesanya. Who would like to go next? I'll go. Uh... So the odds are pretty wide, wider than I even thought. Uh, Izzy is minus 650. Sean Strickland is plus 480. Yeah, that's about in, right. in, in my mind, I was thinking like four something and three something. I didn't think it was going to be quite that big. Um, three inches of height for Izzy, four inches of reach for Izzy. Um, this is a fun fight for me. I, I, I'll admit, I, I like this fight. I, I, I think that Sean Strickland presents more of an interesting challenge than it seems like the masses generally do from what I've seen uh, thus far in regard to this fight. It seems like everyone's kind of just picking Izzy in a walk and I'm picking Izzy too, but I think it could be interesting and, and maybe even a fun fight. Like Sean Strickland knows how he has to fight this fight. And that's just to do exactly what he always does to walk forward, to try to crowd Izzy, to pressure him, to make it a little ugly, to not get caught by a big shot. Like, these are all things that Sean Strickland does in every fight he's in, except for the Pereira fight where he did get caught by the big shot, but generally speaking. Um, so all he really has to do to make this interesting is to successfully play the game he usually plays. Um, now, I don't know if he can against Izzy, but if he does, I think this could this could turn into a pretty entertaining fight. And, of course, it's going to be a huge risk for him to, to be walking Izzy down. I mean, just ask per Pereira, which has happened to him. But it's the only way he wins this fight. That or introducing a bit of grappling, which I'd honestly really like to see him try to do because he is a good grappler, but he doesn't love to grapple. So I'm, I'm not sure we actually see him try that. He actually just shitted on jiu-jitsu today in an interview. I don't know if you guys saw that. They were asking him about, isn't he a black belt? And he was like, yeah, but jiu-jitsu doesn't work, so fuck that. So, <laughs> like, um, so yeah, I don't know if we actually see that. I, I it, it would make it even more interesting if, if he was willing to try that. But um, after saying all of that to explain why I think that it's a fun matchup, I, I do certainly still favor Izzy simply because he is better. His technique is higher level. His timing is better. He's faster for sure. He carries more power. You know, the boxes are still all checked for Izzy. And as much as Strickland is hard to hit and hard to hurt because he rolls with punches so well, Izzy's the kind of striker who hits you with the one you don't see, and, and there's no rolling with that. And that's ultimately ultimately what I think will happen. I think Izzy will, will set something up. Sean won't see it coming, and he will go down. Um, prior to that, I think Izzy probably rips at the legs where he can to try to slow Sean's advance. I think we'll see him be pretty patient early just to try to get the timing down and test some setups, but eventually I think he finds it. Um, I will say as well that it is a round three TKO. Omar? Yeah, I mean, the thing that you have to remember about Izzy for me is the entire the entirety of the fight 
he's generally trying to set up traps. And I think in a lot of respects, some of the guys that he's fought don't necessarily run into his traps. And the criticism then is who who push, who goes first, right? Um, I don't think Sean Strickland is the kind of guy at this point. I think we've seen him in all these fights. He's very aggressive. He's going to come forward, and he's going to force Israel Adesanya to fight. And I think that's when Israel is at his, his, his scariest, if we're being honest. Um, Israel reacts very well. I think his his reactions in moments and split seconds, I think, are fantastic. But like I said, again, the, the traps, I think, are what make him one of the more dangerous strikers in the UFC at this point. Um he sets guys up, I think, without these guys even realizing they're about to get set up. And I think something similar to what happened to uh, Strickland against Pierre Pereira is, is probably what's going to end up happening here. I simply think that the power of Pereira just made it happen a lot sooner than it will against Adesanya. Um, but I think Adesanya's striking is going to be a little bit too clean. Uh, and his, his range management should be a lot better than, than Sean Strickland's as well. And he should have the length to take advantage of that. So... I'm going to go with Adesanya, obviously. Uh, I'm going to go with second round TKO here. The thing that concerns me about any fight with Sean Strickland is that his crazy ass could pull something wild out and just land something stupid uh, and and win because we've seen it happen before. Uh, we've definitely seen him win entire fights, every round of entire fights, using that little modified Philly shell that he uses, that only he uses in MMA. Um but I think against somebody like Israel Adesanya, he's going to have a lot of trouble doing that. And so I think the only way he's going to win this fight is if he does dumb or unorthodox things, which Sean Strickland is very capable of doing. 